नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू इंडियन डिप्लोमेसी शो ऑन दूरदर्शन इंडियाज नेशनल ब्रॉडकास्टर अबाउट इंडियाज फॉरन पॉलिसी इंडियाज इंटरनेशनल रिलेशन इंडियाज मेजर स्ट्रेटेजिक पार्टनरशिप्स एंड ऑल्सो ग्लोबल जियो पोलिटिकल एंड इकोनॉमिक डेवलपमेंट्स दैट हैव एन इम्पैक्ट ऑन इंडियाज राइज एज अ मेजर पावर व्यूअर्स इन दिस एपिसोड वी आर टेकिंग अप द थीम ऑफ द चेंजिंग नेचर ऑफ वॉरफेयर ग्लोबली एंड रीजनली वी सी न्यू कॉन्सेप्ट न्यू डॉक्ट्रीन्स न्यू टैक्टिक्स न्यू वेपन्स and new forms of conflict that have emerged so we are going to be discussing uh, warfare and what this means for india's uh, rise in the world with a very very special uh, distinguished guest let me introduce you to him i have with me major general shashi astana general Namushka. astana is a decorated soldier a uh, retired officer of the indian army he was director general infantry uh, of the indian army and uh, he is presently director of courses at the united service institution an important uh, national military think tank and a noted geopolitical uh, commentator and analyst uh, general astana welcome to indian diplomacy thank you thank you and a pleasure to be on your show general astana um, the nature of war has always changed over time with technological developments and uh, shifts uh, but today we are in the third decade of the 21st century and there's been a lot of focus on you know major transformations revolution in military affairs people talk about you know fundamental shifts that have been happening especially related to technological changes and uh, in that context there is the big overarching picture people say is that we are now in a possibly in a new cold war involving the two big great powers and underneath that there are so many other uh, patterns that you can see so your opening thoughts uh, general on what is this new kind of uh conflict or warfare that we are seeing in the context of this new cold war uh firstly uh, let me uh, work let me talk about the global scenario uh at the global level after second world war people thought that the cold war 1.0 between russia and united states would be over with the disintegration of ussr mm. but it didn't happen because apparently uh nato despite the promise of not an inch eastward which baker said and promised gorbachev they kept expanding eastwards and therefore that cold war 1.0 continued in addition to that china came up as a big power and mm. a big player and a big global player and under xi jinping they had their aims right in a manner that by 2049 they would take over uh, the mantle of uh, the global superpower or the lone superpower from from ussa from usa so considering that uh, the cold war between united states and china also started which we call it as cold war 2.0 mm. earlier the strategic thoughts in usa also were that usa should not tackle china and ussr together even kissinger said so at some point of time but in biden administrations perhaps they mixed up cold war 1.0 and 2.0 very badly with the result we find that they have got involved with russia and there is a russia ukraine war mm. and that is an extension of cold war 1.0 at the same time there is a tremendous amount of military posturing in south china sea and issues related to taiwan and yeah. also fair amount of build up which is leading to cold war 2.0 which is also going on simultaneously and now america is finding it difficult mm. to handle both together and therefore you find that the american influence is winning away slightly uh, when you look at the middle east uh you have you one has seen that uh, saudi arabia is, uh, is defying uh, the us yeah, yeah quite is, openly is behaving yeah. in a slightly different manner mm. which may not be very comfortable to uh, usa uh, similarly their footprints from afghanistan have reduced so therefore the afpac region also uh, doesn't have the american influence the kind of influence which they used to have earlier mm. so therefore this cold war has now transformed into a number of other wars mm. now from this cold war emerges what kind of warfare now it is going on you see between russia and ukraine today the contact kinetic war is being fought between russia and ukraine but that is not the actual war the actual war is 
between Russia and NATO. Mm. And that is being fought in the non-contact, non-kinetic war domain, which comprises of many things, which is in the form of economic war, information war, diplomatic war, political war, mm. and war by proxy. And that proxy has also got converted into hybrid war. And let me also explain it to the view yeah. viewers. Yeah. That what happens is, uh, we all are aware of the wars like conventional war. Conventional war is between two armies and two, two defense forces. Then between peacetime to conventional war, mm. the entire spectrum is called as subconventional war, as far as the Indian terminology is concerned. But this is also called as durable disorder uh, by the Westerners, like uh, there is a strategist called as Sean McFate. Mm. Now, Sean McFate says that uh, uh, this is an era of durable, durable disorder. disorder. Then uh, we also call it, when it comes to in the context of Pakistan, we call it no war, no peace. Mm. So this is the third dimension or the, it's almost the same thing, same dimensions being called differently in different places. But everything from peacetime till conventional war is of conventional war. Now, if you mix up a conventional war with anything like uh, proxy war mm. or insurgency mm. or uh, uh, shall I say information war, uh, then it is called as hybrid war. Mm. Now, this is the new definition which has come as hybrid war. And when you mix up with other things, uh, you would have heard a term called as gray zone warfare. Yeah. Because lot many strategists use these uh, terms in wrongly or inappropriately. Yeah, yeah. Now, gray zone warfare, the difference is between the hybrid war and gray zone warfare is that gray zone warfare involves that everything between uh, uh, war is, is black, Mm -hmm. and peace is gray. So everything in between is gray zone. Now in that, you also have the content of the economic war mm -hmm. and the content of the diplomatic and the content of the political and all, all other contents, including cyber, including media. Uh, so when you mix up all that, mm -hmm. that is then you are operating in the gray zone. And you are saying that all of these, so viewers, uh, what General Astana is saying is that, uh, you know, we are in a more complex environment where many of the watertight categories that were seen as separate forms of conflict, now they're all being merged into uh, more uh, complicated forms of uh, conflict, uh, and it's not as simple as it used to be before. Uh, but the fundamental uh, structural divide that we have talked about, which is defining this new Cold War, is the U.S.-China competition. Uh, let's hear this uh, news report uh, on U.S.-China competition, especially in the military domain, how it's fanning out and continue the discussion. The U.S. says two dangerous encounters with China in recent weeks signal rising military aggressiveness from Beijing. After the close calls, one at sea and one in the air, White House spokesperson John Kirby called them unacceptable. Both of those incidents were in, com in co uh, complete compliance with international law. There was absolutely no need for the PLA to act as aggressively as they did. So it, it won't be long before somebody gets hurt. Uh, that's, the, that's the concern with these unsafe and unprofessional intercepts. Uh, they can lead to misunderstandings, they can lead to miscalculations. That warning followed this video released by the U.S. Navy on Sunday, showing what it called an unsafe interaction with a Chinese warship in the sensitive Taiwan Strait. It appears to show a Chinese vessel crossing in front of a U.S. destroyer, forcing it to slow down to avoid a collision. And at the end of May, a Chinese jet carried out what the U.S. called an unnecessarily aggressive maneuver near an American military plane over the South China Sea within international airspace. Kirby said if China wanted to show that the U.S. was not welcome in the area or to stop American vessels supporting freedom of navigation, it would not succeed. I sure would like to hear uh, Beijing justify what they're doing. That said, uh, these are intercepts. Now look, air and maritime intercepts happen all the time. Heck, we do it. The difference is uh, when we do it, when we feel like we need to do it, it's done professionally and it's done inside the, the, the inter international uh, law and it's done in accordance with the rules of the road. On Monday, a Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson said that, quote, the measures taken by the Chinese military are completely reasonable, legitimate and professional and safe. The recent jump in tensions with the U.S. comes as both sides blame one another for not holding military talks, with disagreements over issues ranging from trade in Taiwan to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So viewers, uh, you saw the heightening military 
uh, encounters between uh, the two great powers of our time and uh, this kind of uh, you know close encounters uh, with the possibility the white house national security spokesman is saying that somebody is going to get hurt and you can't assume that they will somehow avoid collisions or uh, actual kinetic uh, you know conflict uh, so general asana somebody is going to get hurt the americans saying the chinese are saying you know uh, we dare you to come uh, uh, into our uh, t uh, our terrain this is getting quite hot isn't it i mean and even the cold the original cold war also and the new one there are like you said theaters where it can get hot and it's not necessary that the big powers will avoid direct clashes it's possible that they may also happen uh, you know limited wars could happen right so in that context uh, the military communications and all these have also uh, mostly collapsed and they are just not talking to each other the first cold war we used to talk about strategic stability where the soviet union and the americans used to often meet to manage the competition and this time at least so far we are seeing that there is more strategic gap uh, in communication than any kind of uh, dialogue especially in the military sphere they're talking about trade and other things but not on defense and military so it looks like quite a dangerous uh, you know kind of a slide and uh, your thoughts on this you know these aspects and you're you're a military man yourself uh, what kind of signaling and communications should adversaries have with each other, you think, and uh, what is missing right now in the way the Chinese and the Americans are interacting with each other? Uh, see, there is a very heavy military posturing in South China Sea. And as you rightly mentioned, this military posturing can lead to accidental triggers. Mm. Now, these accidental triggers uh, will have to be managed in case if, ever if, if it happens. So the best case is to avoid it. And for avoiding that, uh, communication is necessary, as you rightly mentioned. Now, coming on to as to why this is happening and why it is happening in South China Sea. Mm. Now, this is, this is slightly relevant. Uh, if you see the overall uh, context, USA has got more than 700 military bases all over the world. China doesn't have even more than 20. So Chinese capability outside South China Sea is relatively limited mm. but in south china sea and in and around taiwan and the east china sea and east china yeah. sea in these in this area the chinese military assets which are uh, on the land military land assets on the eastern seaboard they can influence and therefore they are in a right position to match the us military power in that area so that is why china is looking to be little bolder in that area mm. and that is why you find that china dare challenge us in that area but otherwise if you see uh, it's the the war is not going to be fought uh, only in that area in case hypothetically mm. if there is a war then chinese the biggest vulnerability is their sea lines of communication which pass through malacca strait which pass through indian ocean mm. now that is where uh, you see the overall context, uh, America is getting closer to India. Because if you have to checkmate China in some manner or the other, then you have to choke them. And if you have to choke them, then Chinese have a major issue. Because they are not self-contained in everything like America yeah. is, whether they it is oil, food, imports, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Mm. So they depend a lot on, on imports. So mm. that is one issue. Secondly, let me talk about the Chinese strategy. Now, what they are looking at. Chinese used to say that we are following active defense. Mm. Now, from active defense, they went into incremental encroachment. Now, South China Sea has got uh, contradictory uh, EEZ, or shall I say the uh, EEZs are uh, of, of uh, many countries overlapping. are overlapping. Yeah, yeah. So, because if they are overlapping, so obviously it is not China's uh, sea, which they would like to believe. Uh, in fact, China would like to believe that it is uh, China's lake yeah. and that's why they put nine dash line which used to be 11 dash line and two dash dropped in favor of Vietnam and thereafter it became nine dash line. So this is their uh, this is Chinese uh, thought process mm. and now what they did was that during the last election uh, last to last election what they did was that they occupied uh, one of the islands uh, in South China Sea and they subsequently kept building up and then they made it into military base. So they kept encroaching till the time they uh, they f felt an opposition. Mm. Same is the case they follow in Himalayas also. That their policy is even in Doklam, they were trying to make a road till they were physically stopped. 
the moment they physically stopped then they then they don't uh, move further so this is the strategy of incremental encroachment uh, mm -hmm. same was the case with uh, in, in ladakh so this is how they are trying to increase their encroachment and now what they have done is they are doing infrastructure encroachment mm. you make more infrastructure so long it is not stopped uh, it is fine and the moment it is stopped then you hold for some time and then try again if you get a vacant space then move forward and whatever you gain in the bargain so winning without fighting was sun tzu's doctrine mm. now this is what they are following in the real uh, sense also because they don't want to fight intentionally chinese and americans will not like to fight at all mm. but at the same time nobody would like to lose the overall influence and therefore you will find this uh, kind of military poaching uh, uh, the, uh, the showdown military showdown uh, the aggressiveness brinkmanship uh, and such brinkmanship yeah, yeah, all yeah. this will carry on mm. so this is the situation which, which happens and in my opinion even if let's say hypothetically a Uh, accidental trigger does take off mm. i think both will manage because fighting between of usa and china is far too costly for e both of that's them that's right and frankly grave and if great powers fight then it it, it means world war right yeah, i mean exactly. it's just unmanageable and unbearable so uh, but general uh, coming to our uh, context now uh, given this big us china contention uh, where are we uh, positioned in terms of uh exploiting this difference i mean one view is that um you know us china tensions are bad and they destabilize the world the other view is in our region given that china is our number one adversary i don't think we really mind if the americans are uh, applying strategic pressure on china right i mean uh, that's something that is useful to us because then it creates more fronts for china to manage and in that sense uh, i think this cold war unlike the previous one I don't think we are going to sit out, right? I mean, we are not going. We are not really neutral in this because, frankly, we know who our number one challenge is. You are absolutely right. See, a uh, lot many thinkers they keep talking about China trying to put a dilemma of two front war to over India, the China and Pakistan, and therefore the only counter is or the best counter is that we should put up multiple multiple fronts for China. Mm. Now, how do we put multiple fronts? We can't do it alone. So, therefore, uh, we partner. we have the strategic partnership with the usa we have quad uh, quad may not have a military complement as of now mm. but then the fact is that if all the four navies are exercising if they have the interoperability if they have the right posturing and if they have the right assets at the right places then the intentions can change overnight now right. this is a threat which chinese also understand mm. that's why they keep talking about they don't have a clique or something like that so this is one issue and secondly you are right, as you rightly mentioned today our strategic partnership with usa is much more for the very simple reason because we have a commonality and commonality is the uh, is the adversary china is posing a big challenge it is uh, improving its expeditionary capabilities also mm. uh, so therefore uh, certainly they would like to contest in indian ocean also with india if that be so then we need more partners we need more partners says general astara and uh, the point is uh, viewers india is uh, developing its defense diplomacy uh, bringing in large number of uh, countries uh, into a form of a coalition to counterbalance and push back the chinese aggression but indian military it coming to the military is also reorganizing in many ways we are going towards more jointness uh, theater commands uh, we have discussed this in indian diplomacy before but uh, more interestingly also other dimensions of uh, competition and conflict especially with china and to a lesser extent with pakistan are emerging including in the cyber uh, domain and this is where uh, indian military is also reorganizing and restructuring here is a small report about uh, new developments in the indian army uh, to face these challenges let's uh, watch this and then continue the discussion
because uh, you're seeing uh, all these changes in the Indian military formation and the you know posture as well and uh, preparedness for the threats that are emerging. Coming back to General Asana, General Asana, what caught my eye in this report was the uh, point that the cyber domain has become more competitive and our adversaries are also investing a lot in this field, uh, including disinformation and all sorts of those uh, you know, hybrid techniques that you are talking about. And now the army has you know, moved uh, to catch up with all those you know, threats and to preempt them. So uh, how are we de doing on the non-kinetic domains? I mean, this is something people, you know, our audience mostly thinks of the military as, you know, preparing for conventional war or asymmetric war with, uh, you know, uh, jihadist groups and such thing. But uh, really, this uh, yeah, non-kinetic domains have emerged as an important arena for conflict, especially with perception and with uh, molding and manipulating opinions um, in the global arena. So your thoughts on how our non-kinetic preparations uh, are going on in the context of this changed warfare. Okay. Uh, firstly, uh, to answer your question, let me also give you a little background. Chinese have a strategy called as three warfare strategy. Now, three warfare strategy means first is the media, second is psychological warfare and third is legal warfare. Mm. And this they mesh up with the technological warfare and uh, shall I say uh, the cyber warfare also. So basically, this is the age of information warfare and we have all these threats. Now to cater for all these threats, uh, Indian defense forces are also preparing very hard. Earlier we had a defense cyber agency, but that mm. was at the national level. Uh, in, uh, ideally, we were looking for an information warfare command, but we are a little far from it as of now, uh, but we are developing towards that. Uh, so defense cyber agency was announced a couple of years back. And very recently, what we have done is that we have given some cyber capabilities to the commands for mm -hmm. operation as well as for supporting our, uh, our uh, military operations. Uh, as far as the national level is concerned, because we also have to have uh, the support and defense of the uh, national infrastructure from cyber. Mm. So cyber attacks are at in two, uh, there is a, uh, in two domains. One are the systems. Uh, and second is the military hardware or shall I say the national hardware uh, like power grid was sometimes mm. broken by cyber. Critical uh, infrastructure. Critical infrastructure. So that is uh, called as hard kill. Mm. And when you talk of systems that you don't let other guy operate, uh, don't let the command control system of the Indian military operate, that is called as soft kill. Mm. So India is preparing for both. Our military is also now mm -hmm. uh, preparing in, in a number of manner. Uh, that uh, we are, uh, firstly we are creating capabilities, we are also pooling in uh, the required talent mm. and that talent and that's why the technological entries and the kind of the technological content in our training has, in, has increased mm. many fold. Similarly, the technological arms have also expanded. Uh, now most of the, uh, uh, ca uh, the uh, cadets in NDA, they are also technically qualified. Right. So, Manpower also we are improving. Similarly, uh, as far as the equipment is concerned, we are improving. I won't be talking about the kind of equipment uh, on the national television sure. in the open domain, but uh, suffice, suffice to say mm. that we are increasing these capabilities. And, and the fact that what the video which you saw yeah. was basically to ensure that even at the military level, to ensure that our command and control structure during operations uh, gets protected. Now that capability we have to give to the operational commands and to the theater commands and as, as, as in when they appear. And, and, so that's and, what we are. And, and general last word on AI. I mean, everyone's talking about AI and many countries are investing heavily in this and AI enabled, you know, weaponry and, uh, you know, tactics and strategies. Uh, how are we preparing in the AI domain? Are we being able to bring in this whole intelligence, uh, you know, uh, uh, based uh, machine learning based killer robots and there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, notions out there that militaries are going to become fully automated and, uh, you know, dehumanized and that machine machines are going to fight against uh, machines and it's going to be metal versus metal and all these things. So what India, are we preparing for AI enabled warfare? Yes, we are preparing for AI enabled warfare. Uh, there are certain institutions uh, which have been tasked. There are certain institutions which within the military which have been created as nodes. Mm. Uh, then we are also looking at uh, certain induction of uh, the trained manpower 
uh, to handle that. Uh, similarly, uh, there is also, uh, shall I say, uh, a fair amount of, uh, one is the awareness, we have to train people, we have to train our, and we also have to make our systems, uh, systems in place. Uh, so, AI enabled systems are being worked out and this will be in two domains. One is we are also working out uh, as far as the indigenous development is concerned. Uh, there are various institutions, the DRDO is also gearing up and DRDO has got a major complement mm. on AI now. Mm. Uh, similarly, uh, our, uh, some of our technological institutes, I will not name the institutes, uh, but they have also been tasked accordingly and there are various AI courses which are going on. Mm. Uh, similarly, uh, we will also, we are also working on uh, uh, the certain induction of equipment, mm. uh, state of the art equipment, which we are going to buy. So that is also from our far foreign partners. Yeah, from our foreign partners. So right. that is also we are we are looking at. Right. Uh, similarly, as far as machine learning is concerned, uh, I think uh, we have also uh, we have already uh, started off certain prototypes being made out of machine learning. Yeah. Uh, so there are a lot. There is a lot of development which is uh, right. going on on the so non-quantitative domain. Right. So viewers, lots of developments, a work in progress, but definitely one has to keep up with the times. And uh, India is preparing for this uh, new battleground that's emerging on the world stage. There's a lot of conflict, a lot of geopolitical contention, and also uh, opponents trying to outdo each other uh, through technological means uh, in the military. And uh, certainly, it's a great challenge. It's a very uh, high-speed era where a lot of changes are happening uh, very quickly. And uh, to be able to adapt to these changes and to be able to uh, uh, be on par with adversaries or to even dominate the adversaries, that is the ultimate goal of the Indian military and also of our diplomatic uh, community, which is trying to support uh, all our defense diplomacy. So uh, let's keep an eye on uh, changing nature of war and military developments, because that's so significant. I want to thank um, General Astana for uh, sharing such uh, invaluable insights. Thank you, General. Thank you. It was a great pleasure uh, interacting with you and uh, to the viewers. Thank you very much. So viewers, uh, let's uh, follow military technology, military doctrines. Uh, these are very important for India's rise and uh, they are arguably very central for India to become a leading power in the world. I'll see you again next time. Until then, take care.